Uh, chapter 2, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 12. This is kind of a milestone for me because this was the last message I taught at Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz before I stepped down as pastor. And when I taught it on Wednesday night, I had no idea I'd be stepping down on Sunday. And that following Sunday, uh, we, we met with, with our family and we met with the elders. I, I, on Saturday, we decided and Sunday, I got up and told our church that I was stepping down as their pastor. And so this was the last message I taught at Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz. So you know what? And God, know, God knows what he's doing. Can I get an amen to that? You know, God is in control. God knew the trials and struggles we would go through, and God knew that that would bring us to Calabasas. And so I'm thankful because I would have never met you guys. Amen? So I'm thankful. God is good all the time. Trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you as we go to your word right now. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Lord, we don't want the words of the opinions of men, which is taught in so many places today, and it's just nonsense. It's of no value. Lord, what we want is the living, breathing Word of God reaching into the hearts of your children, of people that know you and those that need to know you. And so, Lord, please now we pray, less of me, more of you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill us all afresh. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So, 2 Samuel, as we get here to tonight's chapter, we saw that at the end of 1 Samuel, that Saul had died. David had been on the run for waiting from the time he was anointed. It's been about 10 years. And he spent many years on the run, living in caves. And he got to the point where we saw David on that roller coaster ride in his faith. And sometimes maybe we can relate to that, where moments he was fighting giants and he was slaying enemies. And then he was running and hiding and pretending to be a madman and lying to the priests that ended up losing them, their, costing them their lives. And all the things that David went through. And then when we get to the end of 1 Samuel, he's living in a cave. He's, after living in caves, he's now living with the Philistines. And the Philistines believe he's on their side. And it gives the Philistines boldness because Saul at that time was weak. And David, who was the one they feared the most, was on their side, or they believed that was the case. So as we know, Saul dies. He dies at the hands of an Amalekite. Again, if he killed all the Amalekites, that never would have happened, right? Maybe he's supposed to kill them all, and then an Amalekite brings word of his death. We don't put the flesh to death. The flesh will kill us. Amen? And so now it's transition time. But what's interesting is David didn't just go and seize the, the, becoming the king. He asked the Lord for direction. You remember that from two weeks ago? And guys, just because he knew that he was anointed to be the king, he did not want to move until the Lord told him it was time. And even though we may know that something is of the Lord, guys, it's not just being obedient to what God wants, but doing it in God's perfect timing. Can I get an amen to that? And how many of you guys love to wait? How many of you guys love waiting? It's like your favorite thing. You love to wait. Love, love nobody. But the reality is, when we are waiting, God is working. Amen? Whenever we are waiting, God is always at work. God's timing is perfect. God is preparing either your heart or the heart of the one that divine appointment is going to take place, or he's preparing the people you're going to minister to, or if you're waiting to be married, he's preparing the person you're going to marry, or he's preparing you. If it's a job, whatever it is that you're waiting upon, God is in control. God is faithful. God knows what he's doing. And if anybody is learning that lesson, it's David. Because you've been anointed as a teenager, and now 10 years have gone by, and he prays and says, Lord, should I go up? And he went up and he told him to go to Hebron. And so now David was anointed as the king over Judah. But keep in mind, that's one tribe. That's his tribe. But the other 11 tribes, as we saw last week, that Abner, who was Saul, we'll talk more about this tonight, who's related to Saul, he wants to keep the kingship in his family. He doesn't want what God wants, he wants what he thinks is best for him and for his family. Because if, if your family's in power, then your family has power. Amen? There's wealth and there's influence and all these things. You know, there's a, there's a reason why people will spend $50 million to become president of the United States for a job that pays four hundred grand. they are not trying to get the job for the money. They want the power. They want the position. They want the influence. And the same is happening here. So Abner takes Ishmasheth. We'll talk more about him tonight. But what's amazing to me is when we're at the end of, of, of uh, 1 Samuel, 
Saul and all his sons die, except for this one. You know why he didn't die? He wasn't in the battle. And we're going to find out in the coming weeks, there's a reason why this guy wasn't in the battle, because he's not a warrior. And you know what? Here's the reality. If someone's going to lead, I want a warrior. Can I get an amen to that? I want someone who's willing to step up. You don't want a guy who's going to sit back and you know, pull a King Saul with Goliath. You want someone who's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, who's obedient to the Lord, and is, a, is someone who leads people fearlessly. Amen? Well, that's not a ship, uh, Ishbosheth, and we're going to see more about him tonight. So last week, we talked about a family divided. And the reason I called it a family divided, these 12 tribes of Israel, they're family. Amen? They're all descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so as descendants, they're one big family, but this family is at war. Hard to imagine that people in the same family might have division among them. We all know what that's like to some degree. Can I get an amen to that? And we're going to talk about that, but we talk about a family divided. We contrasted a man called by God and someone walking in the flesh. And a man who's called by God or a woman who's called by God will always ask the Lord for direction. Men struggle asking for directions from anyone, but we really need to ask the Lord. Can I get an amen? We need to come to the Lord and seek His will and seek His face, and even if it seems obvious to us, we should never make the final decision without spending time on our knees and asking the Lord for His direction. The second thing that a man or woman called by God will do, they'll go where the Lord tells them to go. It's one thing to ask God for direction, and then it's another thing to obey. Sometimes we'll ask, oh, Lord, whatever you want me to do, oh, not that. That's not, I've told this story before. When I went to Santa Cruz, I went and sat down with Pastor Don McClure. I knew it was time to go, and I said, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I just feel like the Lord's going to have you tell me. You're my pastor, wherever you tell me to go. And he's like, oh, South Carolina, there's a group. I said, okay, I'll go to South Carolina. He said, oh, you know, Sam, he named all these cities all over the country where he knew there were Bible studies looking for a pastor. And then he said, well, I think the place I really think you belong is Santa Cruz. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. The glory has departed. I've been there. I, I grew up there. Ichabod. No, 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 no. I, I can't go there. And the reality is that obedience isn't doing what you want. It's doing what God wants. Amen? And now, I will say this. The more you spend time on your knees, you'll find that you want what he wants. Amen? That his will becomes your heart. And it's a get to, not a have to. But sometimes we have to learn to trust in the, in the Lord and, and his calling and his direction. And so a man of God, a woman of God, asks the Lord for direction and goes where the Lord tells them to go. Thirdly, his or her calling is recognized by others. If you're striving to pay, make people notice you, then you need to repent. Because it's not about you and it's never going to be about you and it was never supposed to be about me or you. Can I get an amen to that? And so when people strive for recognition, you can already tell that that person's not called. When God has called somebody, everybody knows it. Can I get an amen to that? And they will faithfully serve whether they're ever ordained or not. It doesn't matter whether anybody ever puts a title by their name. You know what? They'll do it for the Lord. It'll be a get to, not a have to. It'll be a joy of their life. And you know what? Someone who's called by God will be recognized by others. Don't strive for position. Just be faithful. And then Fourthly, someone who's called blesses and encourages others for their faithfulness. You know, praise God for the Barnabases of this world. Amen? Barnabas was the son of encouragement. And you know, I, I have people in my life. There's a prayer group still up in Santa Cruz. There are these older ladies that are retired, and they would come, and every time we had church, while I was teaching, they would sit in a room and pray. And then when I went to the hospital, they got a 24-hour prayer chain of people that would be in the chapel where I was in the hospital, so somebody was praying for me 24 hours a day. I want to tell you something. I can think of no greater gift anybody can be given than someone praying for you. Can I get an amen to that? And we need those sons and daughters. To this day, I still get texts from her, from, from them. They'll text me, hey, Pastor Dave, we're thinking about you and your family. We're praying for Calvary Chapel Calabasas. They've never been here. They love you guys. They're praying for you guys. And you know what? Someone who's called by God is a source of encouragement to other people. Amen? And we should be able to encourage people and, and, and also exhort people when necessary and praise God for that. So we saw that last week, that a man or woman called by God asks the Lord for direction, goes where the Lord tells him to go. 
Their calling is recognized by others, and they're blessed, they bless and encourage others for their faithfulness. But then we saw the man walking in the flesh, and he strives to bring about his own will. And we're going to continue in that tonight. If we're going to continue to look at Abner, Joab, we're going to see how things are starting to get positioned as now there's one tribe that's anointed David as king and 11 tribes who anointed Ishbosheth, who's not the king, but he's related to Saul. So from the physical perspective, there could be a case made for him to be the king because he was the son of the king. The king died. His other sons died. He's the one who's left. You can make a case that he's the right guy. You're making a case, though, from the physical, not the spiritual. And too often, we want to make a case based on what makes sense to us, not what the Word of God says. Amen? So grab your outline, and we'll dig into the text. And I tell the message tonight, when a family forgets to pray. Because remember, again, this is still a family. These 12 tribes, these are the, these are the descendants of the people who, mar- who were wandering in the wilderness. These are the people that stood outside the land of promise. These are the people that finally did enter into the land of promise and all that God had for them. And if they just obeyed the Lord, they would have seized it all. But because of compromise, two and a half tribes camped outside when it was easier. There started to be division within them. And now we've come to a place where those who were all united in getting out of Egypt, all united as they finally entered into the land of promise, now they're fighting with each other. And this just reminds me, tragically, of a lot of what we see in the church today. Guys, we're all on the same side. Can I get an amen to that? And instead of bickering and debating over secondary issues, let's go tell somebody who's dying and going to hell without Jesus, let's share with them the love of Christ. Can I get an amen? And so here we have the children of Israel who should be walking together, and instead they're warring with each other. And so I tell the message, when a family forgets to pray, first of all, we declare war instead of seeking restoration. Nobody who's on their knees and walking in intimate fellowship with Almighty God is going to be somebody who seeks to divide. That is not what the Lord has for us. Now again, we don't water down the truth. We don't say that ungodly behavior is okay. But what we do, to, what our heart should be is to restore people into a right relationship with the God who created them, amen? And to reach out to them in love. But when we don't pray, we declare war instead of seeking restoration. It produces division and infighting with the very people who are called to love and serve and provide for and protect. And we view those closest to us we can as roadblocks instead of blessings. Let me, I'm going to give you all a, a, a 30-second marriage counseling session. You ready? Ready? Here it is. I do this every time. I pray with them, and then I say, how's your prayer life? You guys praying together? Uh... Guess what? I can't remember the last time I asked that question when a marriage was in trouble, and I got a yes. It's always a no. I saw this statistic, I don't know how accurate it is, but I saw it, it said that one out of every two marriages end in divorce, one out of every 1,195 marriages where they pray together on a daily basis ends in divorce. Guys, you want your marriage to be strong? Pray together. The most intimate thing I do with my wife is pray with her. And so we need to pray together, amen? You know what, when, when we pray together, we hear each other's hearts. We pray for each other. It's hard to pray for somebody and then be angry and bitter towards that same person. And so the reality is that when a family, a family that prays together stays together, amen? And a family that prays together gets on the same page in serving the Lord. But we're going to see tonight that this family of 12 tribes is not praying together and they're divided and they view each other as the enemy instead of seeing each other as family. Number two along with when a family forgets to pray, we're moved by selfishness and fear, and we bring harm to others. Guys, when we don't pray, we put our own will above the Lord's. We place our desires above the welfare of others. We operate in fear, not in faith, and we fail to put on the whole armor of God. Here's the reality. You know why we're afraid? We're not praying enough. We're not on our knees enough. We're not seeking the Lord enough. You know why we, are, we, we feel like we're far from the Lord? Again, 
we're not far from, you know, God's not far from us. We're far from him. Amen? And we're far from him because we don't talk to him. If I'm, Lynette and I have been married 35 years. If I don't ever talk to her, what kind of marriage would we have? And yet we're married to Jesus and people pray over their Wheaties and that's it. You know, they got a three-minute prayer life sometimes. And guys, that's not prayer. If I only talked to my wife for a minute and a half over our Wheaties, our marriage would fall apart. Amen? The reality is there needs to be intimate fellowship. Is Jesus Christ your best friend? Are you spending the day with him? Are you seeking his face? Do you desire to know him better and to make him known? That's what we're called to do. And again, when we, when we don't, family doesn't pray together, it falls apart. And when we don't pray, we seek our, our own will above the Lord's. We place our desires above the welfare of others. We operate in fear, not in faith. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And people say this to me, and I don't want to sound wrong, but they'll say, Pastor Dave, you have the gift of faith. I said, no, you know what I have? I just have a love for Jesus, and I hang out with him a lot. Amen? And people will say, hey, you know, John Corson, I wish I had faith like you. And he said, you can. Read the Bible as much as I do, and you will. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by? Word of God. It's not a secret, you guys. You don't need to go to a self-help program. You don't need to go to, to any kind of a seminar. Just read the book, and don't wait for the movie. Open it up, read it, and obey it. Can I get an amen to that? The Word of God will transform your life. And we live in a world today that wants everything else. I'm tired of, I'm tired of pulpits preaching you know, prosperity doctrine. He doesn't, you know what? My riches are in Christ. I don't want to need a bigger pile of dirt. Can I get an amen to that? I don't need more of the stuff that's passing away. Help us, Lord. And guys, you know what? You can't spend God, time in God's presence and have him not rub off on you. Amen? When you walk in intimate fellowship with him, you know, people say this all the time. I found some old pictures I posted, and people, I found some old pictures I hadn't seen in 25 years. I posted some on Facebook, and they're all saying, oh, that looks like this son of yours, and that looks like your daughter. You know why? When you hang out with your family, you even start kind of looking more alike. Can I get an amen to that? Your mannerisms are the same. You start acting the same. I'll say things, and people go, that's exactly how your dad did his hands. Guess what? When we hang out with Jesus, the same thing happens. When we're spending time with him, people are going to see Jesus in us. Amen? And so we need to pray together. The family that prays together stays together. And when we don't pray, when we forget to pray, we declare war instead of seeking restoration. And we're moved by selfishness and fear. We bring harm to others. Finally, we open ourselves up to a long-term battle with the flesh. See, every day we're battling the flesh, and the only way we're going to win is if we surrender to the Lord, and walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the only way. By the way, the next time you're tempted, don't focus on the thing that is tempting you, focus on the Lord. Don't focus, oh, if I, oh my God, I'm struggling, I gotta I struggle with addiction to drugs, or I struggle with lust, or anger, or bitterness, or whatever it is, and if you try to focus on that and fight that, you're gonna lose. Don't focus on that, focus on Him. And sadly, what happens is when we don't pray, we're not focusing on the Lord, and, and Satan will, he's a defeated foe, he will destroy you if you try to face him in your own strength. Amen? And, and you can't put the flesh to death without walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin there, looking at when a family forgets to pray. We're going to see, here we are, Saul's dead, got 12 tribes of Israel, David's been anointed as king over one tribe. Abner disregarded the word of God and propped up his nephew or cousin. I'm not sure exactly the relation there is there, but a family member, one of Saul's sons, and he props him up to be the next king over the other 11 tribes. And so that's going to bring division in this family, in God's chosen people. And let's see how this works out. And we'll be seeing this over the next several chapters. It says there, now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went from Mahanaim to Gibeon. Now, Abner, the son of Ner, that makes him Saul's first cousin, 
Remember, he was a tough military man, completely devoted to the cause. He was a man who seems to believe that he is doing the right thing by making Ishbosheth the king. But let me make it really clear. There wasn't anybody in Israel who didn't know that David was supposed to be king. Even Saul said it. How many times do we see Saul say it? Oh, you're so much more godly than me. Oh, David, you know, you're the man that God has. Oh, David, please forgive me. And then he goes back, and a few days later, he's trying to kill him again. But even Saul understood it. Everybody understood it. David is God's man. And what what does Abner do? He knows what the Word of God says. He knows what God has commanded, and he chooses to do just the opposite, and he makes a physical case for what he wants. Well, he's the son of Saul. He's next in line. He should be the king. Let's make him the king. Guys, I'm tired of Christians falling into the trap of trying to make logical arguments that are contrary to the word of God. We have people today trying to say that homosexual marriage is okay, that abortion is okay, that things the word of God so clearly condemns, and they're trying to act like it's okay because they look at the circumstances of the world and they preach from that perspective. And guys, the word of God is always right, and man is always wrong when he disagrees with it. Every single time. And here's Abner. It's obvious. Everybody knows David's the guy. But Abner also knows if David becomes the guy, there may not be a place for Abner anymore. Matter of fact, Abner might be in fear that he might lose his own life if David's in charge. So he's going to prop up somebody else so his flesh can have what he wants. The next time you're making a decision, as you're seeking direction and wisdom, is this pleasing God or is this pleasing my flesh? Is this something that will bring glory and honor to his name? Or is it something that will make me more comfortable or will feed my fleshly desires? He makes him king. Now what's interesting is they, it says Mahanaim is, what's interesting is they move down. Now they've got 11 tribes. And Judah is in the southernmost part. They move all the way down where they're right on the border of Judah. This is an aggressive thing that's taking place. So not only is he making Ishbosheth the king, but now he's going to come down and basically challenge David being king even over one of the tribes. And so this is an aggressive stance that's being taken. He's made a decision. Have you ever noticed that people who are walking in rebellion against God want to force what they believe on the people who stand in faith before God? Amen? Are we not being called bigots and everything else if we don't agree with ungodliness? Can I get an amen to that? So here's what's happening. He's going to bring them down, and they're going to bring their army down, and they're going to step into right into the territory where David is with the the one tribe that he's overseeing. And this is an aggressive stance being taken as they cross over the Jordan. And again, they made him king, hallowed in times past, again, It's the same place where uh, Jacob was visited by angels. Again, in making Ishbosheth king, again, he would point back to the natural order of things. The major problem is that he's moving based on man's laws that seem right and the natural way of things. By the way, just because something legal doesn't mean it's godly. I don't care what they vote on. I don't care what they say is okay. I don't care. It's still sin. It's still wrong. I have a Christian who is smoking a joint right in front of me. I'm like, I'm like, really, bro? Hey, you know, I got a prescription. I'm like, dude, really? Are we going to have this discussion right now? Be not drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen to that? Every time you smoke a joint, you're getting high. Can I get an amen to that? Dude, it's wrong. And the reality is that, well, it's legal. You know, I guess it's not against the law to commit adultery. So is that okay? Guys, the word of God is the standard, not the laws of man. And just because he was the next guy in line doesn't mean that's what God wants. And just because the world says it's okay, guys, I don't care what the world says. I want to know what the Lord says. Him and him alone. So he could have made a good argument, no doubt did as he 
rally the 11 tribes around Ishbosheth as king. And again, man's ways are not God's ways. And Abner, do we see any praying by Abner here? Anybody, any, any time on his knees right here, he sought the Lord and then made Ishbosheth? No, that didn't happen. And this is what happens in all of our lives sometimes. We don't pray, and then it's a mess, and then we want God to get us out of it. Like it's his fault. Can I get an amen to that? I don't understand why I'm going through so much difficulty. We are walking in open rebellion against the creator of the universe who wrote down to you, for you how you could live a life that was fruitful. It's not his fault. Amen? The highest form of worship is obedience. Abner is in total rebellion against God because he did not spend any time on his knees seeking the Lord. When God's family, when families don't pray, they're led in the wrong directions. His actions seem good. But he was in direct rebellion against God who anointed King David. Do you think if he had prayed that God would have said, well, no, it's, Meshav, it's, it's, da- and it's not Ishbosheth, it's David. Of course he would have. But he didn't spend time on his knees. He did not seek the Lord. And again, the king chosen by man over the true king. That already happened once when they chose Saul over God. Amen? And here they are doing it again. God told them, he warned them what would happen if they disobeyed. They disobeyed, the consequences came, and now here they come. Now what's interesting, the the initial heir was Jonathan. Now Jonathan died with his father. If Jonathan had been alive and they tried to make him king, what would have happened? He would have said, I'm not the king, that guy's the king. David's the king, you know why? Jonathan prayed. Jonathan was a man who walked in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Jonathan was a godly man. And he knew David was God's man. And Jonathan wasn't striving for position. He wanted God's will to be done. And so if Jonathan had been alive, he would have said, oh, no, no. Go get David. He's the one who's supposed to be on the throne. So Abner was a mighty man, a loyal man. He was a sincere man. You can be sincere and sincerely wrong. He was led not by the spirit, but by the flesh. And again, he was mighty wrong. You might be here uh, tonight with good and logical reasons for a stand that you're taking. You might be able to make a good argument from a worldly perspective. It means nothing if you have not sought the Lord and moved based solely on, if you're moving based solely on the wisdom of men. Guys, we need to spend time on our knees and ask the Lord for direction every time we make a decision. Can I get an amen to that? Seek the Lord. So they went from man on name to Gibeon. It says there at the end of verse 12. Gibeon, it means hill city. And this is a pretty gnarly city. A lot's taking place here. And it's there that they go, and it's there where they're entrenched, just outside of where David is. Some things that happened in Gibeon back in Joshua chapter 9. It was there that the inhabitants had sent messengers dressed up as travelers from a distant land. Remember the Gibeonites? They came in and pretended like they were from really far away. So they could make a treaty with Israel. Do you remember this? And Joshua made a treaty, and he found out they lived right down the road. And they were just trying to make a treaty so they didn't get wiped out. That's the Gibeonites, and that's where he went. It's, it's funny, the deception people, and now here we got Abner going to the same place. Same thing's happening in the same place over again. Again, there was a battle that took place there in Joshua's day where the inhabitants of Gibeon were attacked. And because of Joshua's treaty with them, he came to their aid. And this is where Joshua prayed that the sun would stand still and the day was an extra 24 hours long so he could complete the battle. Again, that happened in Gibeon. So we saw both ungodly things and godly things have taken place in this city. It was a place where Saul had gone a little wild and had slaughtered some people of Gibeon when he shouldn't have. And this... uh, brought the famine upon the people. There was apparently a well-known high place there where they sacrificed, uh, and one time maybe even the tabernacle of Moses had been in this place. So this is the place where later, in David's latter reign, uh, a man from Sheba tried to revolt from David and then hid in Gibeon. This is where Solomon would offer, offer sacrifices on the high place, and God would meet him in a dream and ask him what he wanted. He said, I'll give you anything you want. And what did, Sol- what did Solomon ask for? For wisdom. All happened in Gibeon. So this is a significant place. And the most significant part is it's right on the outskirts of Judah. It's like you're, I've made a fleshly decision and I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to stand right here and challenge you. 
I know that they say that you're God's man. I know that they say that's God's will. And I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to challenge that. And guys, we live in a world today, boy, that sounds like the world we live in, doesn't it? We make a stand for the Lord and people will challenge it. I've been called an idiot by more people online because I'm a Christian. Oh, the big spaghetti monster in the sky. Oh, you believe that, you know, some guy put a bunch of animals on a boat. You really believe that? You don't believe in climate change. You don't believe in that. You believe in Adam and Eve. You really believe that? You know, you believe that a man was swallowed by a fish. I go, bro, you believe that that fish turned into a man. You tell me what takes more faith. Can I get an amen to that? And the reality is that we're attacked, and we're attacked because they are, at the depths of their soul, convicted. Amen? There's conviction at the depths of their soul that they're wrong. And so Abner wants to bring about what he has done. He wants to bring confrontation ultimately with David so that, they, so that Ishbosheth runs unopposed. He wants to take care of the David problem. So he comes down to the outskirts. He mounts up his army of guys. And guess what? Confrontations come in verse 13. And Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servants of David, went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down, one on one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. So Joab, if Abner is, was Saul's you know, general, Joab is David's. And so when they find them, mount it up. Now keep in mind, they're all family, but they're opposing each other at this point because they've anointed one king, and that's a challenge to David being king. And they come out by the pool, and here's Joab with some of David's men, and here's Abner with some of Saul's men. And they're mounted up, looking across at each other. Does this remind you of anything? David and Goliath. Can I get an amen? So David and Goliath, and they're mounted up, and they're just kind of trying to psych each other out, and everybody's scared half to death except Goliath. And he's coming down and challenging them, and no one will step up. And we're, we're going to see that instead of a one-on-one -on -one battle, there's going to be a 12-on-12 battle. And if somebody wins this battle, they'll say, this will keep us from having all of our armies to fight. And so they're going to challenge each other. So jo jo Joab is David's nephew. Zeruah is David's sister. And again, Joab is apparently one of the 400 men who joined David in the cave of Adullam. And like Abner, he was a fierce and mighty warrior, completely devoted to the cause. And Joab, we will see, is far from perfect. We're going to see it in tonight's chapter. But he's David's man, and he believes David is God's man, and he's going to stand for David. But more importantly, he's God's man. Abner, Saul's general, now Ishbosheth's general, and Joab is David's general. So they sat down one-on-one. -on -one. You can just see them mounting up. Two armies come in. They're staring at each other across this, this body of water. You know, the challenges are about to be made. What's going to happen here? In response to Abner and them moving this, this step of aggression right down to where the children of Judah, where they were in Judah, they're all gathered up there. They're going to go out and confront these guys. Again, it's like the Philistines and the Israelites in the valley of Elah. Now again, this is all family. They're all related to Jacob. Everybody around this pool is related to Jacob. Everybody around this pool has ancestors, again, who wandered through the wilderness, who were delivered out of bondage in Egypt, ancestors that entered the land of promise. And here they are marking off against each other when they should have been joining together to fight the enemy. May that be a word for us as Christians. Amen? This is tragic. These are results of rebellion, verse 14. Then Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. So they arose and went over by number, twelve from Benjamin, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve from the servants of David. So instead of David versus Goliath, instead of one man coming down and challenging them, they each raise up twelve guys. I think it's interesting, there's twelve tribes of Israel, right? Amen? And you would think, that they would be joining together, and now they're going to battle each other. And it doesn't say in the text, but I believe the context was that whichever side wins this 12 on 12 can maybe appointed the victors of this battle. That instead of having everybody fight and you know, hundreds or thousands die, maybe this 12 on 12 will be the answer. But watch what happens. Because again, anybody praying? Anybody praying? Anybody get on their knees? 
you know, if these 24 guys got in a circle and put their arms around each other and sought the Lord, do you think they might have had some better results? And instead they decide, uh, they're going to have a little battle. We're going to find out. Uh, nobody wins this battle. Everybody in it's going to die. That's what happens. Let the young men now arise. Let them come before us. And again, he had 11 tribes behind him, although the 12 came from the tribe of Benjamin. And it's a confident uh, general who believes he has a superior army and could defeat David and take over the entire kingdom. He was confident of victory, and he calls for this representative combat. He was confident he was going to win. You know what? Someone else was confident he was going to win. Goliath, amen? See, Abner is making the same mistake the Philistines made. He's looking at the size of his army against the size of what he perceives to be his enemy. When, guys, it's not the size of the army that you're about to fight. It's the size of the God who's on their side. And see, Goliath was 11 foot 750, and everybody puckered because they saw a giant of a man. And then David saw him and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that comes against my God, the God of Israel? Who's this guy that comes against God? Dude, you're toast. Are you kidding me? He said light is and light was. He's the Alpha and the Omega, all-knowing, almighty, all-powerful God. Guys, when the world comes against us, God is for us. Who can be against us? And here it is that he thinks the same thing. We got 11 tribes. You got one. You know, our army's bigger than yours. We'll fight you guys. Let's do it. Okay. Guess what? God always wins. Amen? You know, sometimes God will allow his own children to lose when they're outside of his will. But Abner and Goliath made the same mistake, looking at the outward size and strength, and left God out of the equation. Guys, if you leave God out of the equation, you will always regret it. Amen? He should always be, he shouldn't just be in the equation, he is the equation. Amen? It's all about his direction, his will. Lord, what do you have for us? Guys, we get overwhelmed. We get fearful. We get anxious. We get worried. We, we uh, get bitter. We, 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 we start to struggle when we leave God out of the equation. When we set him aside instead of getting on our knees before him and crying out to the Lord. Our God is so much greater than anything we will ever face. So this battle is about to begin. 12 on 12. All could have been avoided had Abner and his men sought and submitted to the Lord, doing things our way and our strength is always far more painful and destructive than just submitting to the Lord. The Bible says the pride of a young man is in his strength and Abner's about to be humble. Look at verse 16. And each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side so they fell down together. Therefore the place was called the field of sharp swords which is in Gibeon. So 24 guys, there's 12 guys on this side, 12 guys, they each grab each other by the head, and they each stab each other in the side, and 24 dudes bleed to death and fall over on the ground and die. Nobody prayed for that to happen. Can I get an amen to that? Nobody sought the Lord. Everybody was doing, was acting according to the flesh. Joab doesn't seek the Lord either. When Abner makes the challenge, and look what happens. So guess what? That representative battle is not going to be the case. There's going to be a real battle now. And we're going to see whose side God is on. It's amazing how when operating in the flesh, small things can quickly get blown out of proportion. Because guess what? As soon as those 24 guys hit the ground, everybody else got involved. Watch what happens. Verse 17. So there was a very fierce battle that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Far better than physical confidence is spiritual desperation. And Abner, operating in the flesh, rebelled against God without any direction, from, sought no direction from the Lord. He put his confidence in his armies. He was quickly humbled by an inferior army. They've got 11 tribes worth of people. Their armored army is bigger, better equipped. David's got a smaller army. Isn't it a common pattern in the word of God? Ask Gideon. Can I get an amen to that? Ask some of these where they're totally overmatched. And you know why God loves for us to be overmatched? Because when we win, we know it's God and it's not us. Amen? 
God gets the glory. So the battle takes place. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. May we never put our faith and our hope and our security in our own strength, our own abilities, and our riches, and our bank account. May we be those who seek his face always and respond in obedience to God's command. See this fleshly rebellion? These are all family members, and now they're killing each other. They're all the 12 tribes of Israel. They're all part of God's chosen people, and they're killing each other. They're fighting with each other. Instead of standing together and worshiping the Lord together and reaching out to the world, again, representing God to a lost and a dying world. When there's rebellion in the family, everybody gets hurt. Rebellion righteously is righteously judged. Let's repent. Let's get right with God before we bring the consequences of our own sin home. Can I get an amen to that? You know, there might be people in your family you need to make things right with. Do your best. Pray for them. Sometimes they don't want to hear it. Pray for them. Amen? We need to reach out to them. Point number two. When a family forgets to pray, we declare war instead of seeking restoration. Nobody, no, we don't see one word of, hey, maybe we should pray together about this. How, what, I wonder what God's will is. Should it be Ishbosheth or should it be David? Let's get on our knees and ask the Lord. That didn't happen. They decided to fight instead. Instead of bringing restoration, they brought, they brought war. Secondly, moved by selfishness and fear, we bring harm to others. This is what happens when we don't pray. We're not spending time with the Lord. We're not walking in intimate fellowship with him. Verse 18. Now, three sons of Zeruah were Joab, Abishai, and Ashael. Ashael was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. Does that seem totally random or what? <laughs> Duke could run. Now, that was something that was highly esteemed in those days. Now, Joab was a military general. These are all nephews of David. And Abishai was a brave spy sent into Saul's army. He brought David to him, found him asleep, uh, asked David for permission to run and spear through Saul. You got to remember that? The guy that walked in and said, he's asleep, we can kill him. And David tells him not to. That's Abishai. Ashahel, his name means God has made. And he's described in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 11 as a valiant man. And he could run. He was swift of foot. In those days, it was deemed a great accomplish, accomplishment. Qualifications to be a Roman soldier, you needed to be able to run swiftly and swim well. This guy could run. When I played football in college, we had a guy on our team, his name was Rufus Love III. You got to love that. And Rufus Love III was the fastest human being I've ever seen in my life. Man, that guy could run. I would be busting my tail running, and he would be gliding by me. That's Abishel. That dude just, everybody else is, you know, and it just gliding by, runs. Have you ever seen gazelles move? It didn't even look like they're trying. Can I get an amen to that? That's a key, important to understand because he's going to use this, this gift that he has, but he too is going to make a mistake. Look what it says. So Ashael, Ashael pursued Abner. And in going, he did not turn to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. Now, I appreciate this because He's a nephew of David. He recognizes that Abner is bringing an army against the, the rightful king, and he's going after him. And he's not being distracted by anybody else in this battle. He sees Abner, and guess what? He's faster than Abner. So he's catching up on him, and he's running after Abner, and he's using these gifts that he has. But we're going to see in a minute that he's so focused on the natural gift that he has, he doesn't stop to put on any armor. Things might slow him down. And he's chasing after Abner. He's running after this enemy of King David. So Abner just moments earlier, physically bold and aggressive. By the way, if he's running after him, it means Abner's running away. Can I get an amen? So Abner was pretty tough. We're going to fight you guys. Just mount up. And all of a sudden, they're getting whipped. He's running. Philistines did the same thing after David's head came, or after uh, Goliath's head came off and he crashed on the ground and the dust settled and David's holding up Goliath's head. All the Philistines went from whoa to running away. Same thing's happening here. He sees Abner running. He's going to chase him down. The Bible rocks, amen? Man, somebody make this movie right here. I want to see this. Can you give an amen? But read the book. We don't have to wait for the movie, Amen. 
So he had initiated the battle with Joab and David's men, and when things started to turn, his real self-serving character, is he worried about anybody else in the army right here? He's running for his life. And see, that's what people do who operate in the flesh. They'll be real bold and real, real powerful, but when things get difficult, they protect only themselves, and they'll run away instead of getting on their knees, seeking the Lord, trying to bring restoration, and that's what's happening here with Abner. He didn't stay and fight alongside his men, but ran away to save himself. His fleshly confidence had quickly turned into fear. And so here comes a guy way faster than you, and all this other fighting's going on all around him, and he's running right through everybody, and he's got eyes only for Abner. I'm coming for you, bro. And I'm faster than you, and you ain't getting away, and I'm not getting distracted by anything else, and he's running after Abner. Watch what happens. Abner looked behind him. Are you Azahel? He answered, I am. He looks behind him, and the dude's moving too quick not to be Azahel. Words, about, words out about this guy. This guy's the fastest guy around, and he's catching up. And Abner looks back, dude, why are you chasing me? Again, Abner started this, didn't he? Didn't he bring his army down against David's people? Didn't he bring this aggression down? And now that things aren't going his way, he's running for his life. He's not fighting the battle. He's not seeking the Lord. He's being very self-centered and selfish, and he's running away. By the way, you don't want a, you don't want a general who runs away. Amen? You bring down the enemies, general, open the door for David. See, he understands Ashahel has the right idea. Ashahel says, look, if I kill Abner, that's their general. If their general dies, the army may just give up. They won't have the guy to lead them. So are you Ashahel? I am. He's running in his armor, spear in hand. Ashahel is fleet of foot, no weapon, no armor, gaining quickly. Abner recognized him by both his appearance and the fleetness of his feet. Look what it says in verse 21. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay a hold of one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. Now again, I love his heart. Go get the general. But guys, if we're going to go into battle, we better make sure we're armored up. Can I get an amen to that? The Bible says to put on the whole armor of God. If we just go out with great zeal and we're not prayed up, can I get an Amen. We go out with great zeal and we don't have the shield of faith and the, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the, you know, the, the belt of truth. If we don't have those things and we go out in our own strength and we can have a lot of zeal, but you know what? Zeal without knowledge is dangerous, amen? So he's going after him and he's chasing him down and he's got the right heart. I, didn't, I don't see, did, did I just pray about chasing Abner? Anybody praying anywhere in this chapter? Anybody at all got on their knees anywhere? This is a mess. And this is what happens when a family forgets to pray. Amen? Look at that. What kind of general is that? Just kill one of my other people. Grab a hold of one of those other dudes. Kill him and take his armor. Just leave me alone. Now, we're going to follow that guy. Abner is someone who says, kill them so I can live. Jesus said, take, kill me so they can live. Can I get an amen to that? So here's Abner getting chased down, takes someone else's army, armor as a trophy of war and victory. Abner appears both fearful and selfish. Again, take one of my men, just leave me alone. But Asahel would not stop following him. Verse 22. So Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? See, everything he does is all based on what's going to happen to him. I don't want to kill you, bro, because if I do, Joab is coming after me. So his only concern is not doing what's right. It's not restoration. It's not seeking the Lord. It's, not, it's only about what's going to happen to him if he does this. Why should I strike you to the ground? Again, it would appear that Abner is trying to spare Azahel's life out of kindness of his heart. Dude, I don't want to have to kill you, but the real reason was he was afraid of what would happen, knowing that he would unleash some serious vengeance that would come from his brothers and the rest of his family. My watch stop. What time is it? 8.07. Someone wave me at 8.20, okay? All right. So notice what happens here. Look at verse 23. 
However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear, so the spear came out of his back. That's not a good day. Hard to get happy after that. He's running after him. He's got great zeal. He gets up close, and the guy's faster than him, but he has no armor on, so Abner just stops. And more than likely, he had a point on the bottom of his spear, like where you could put it in the ground where it would stick, and he just stops and reaches back, and the spear goes right through him. Guys, when we run, we want to make sure we've heard from the Lord. Again, zeal without knowledge, and you can be sincere, amen? But guys, we want to make sure that we're not ahead of the Lord and behind the Lord, but we're walking right in the center of his will, amen? We, don't, we, we see him chasing the enemy, that's great, but did he seek the Lord? Did he put on the whole armor of God? Guys, if we go and try to fight the enemy without the Lord going before us, we're going to be in trouble. Can I get an amen? Watch what happens. Therefore, Abner struck him with the blunt end of the spear. The spear came outside of his back. It says in the King James Version, it smote him under the fifth rib. Abner's spear, again, came right through him. It says in sec- it, later we're going to see in that Abner, the butt end of his spear, went to Asherah's stomach. So Joab is going to later put Abner to death. I'm giving it away by doing, put, doing the same thing to him. He's going to put a sword in the same spot. The men that were going to kill Ishbosheth later are going to kill him in the same place. Joab will kill another general, Amasa, with the sword in the same place. Abner's spear apparently had, again, a point on the bottom. And again, we're going to see that though he brought this against him, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to come against Abner and Ishbosheth and all of those who follow after him who are in rebellion against the Lord. Asahel could have used more wisdom, and Abner appeared to have been trying to avoid killing him. Some would say it was self-defense, but still a result of Abner's rebellion. This fight should have never taken place. See, what happens is people wait till they're in the middle of the battle, then they point fingers at each other. If people had been honoring the Lord, the battle would have never started. It would have never happened. These are God's people killing each other. These are God's chosen people killing each other. This is family members killing each other. Lord, help us. All this is because Abner made his own king. Then he came against David. And guys, when we rebel, the consequences are always far more reaching than we can ever imagine they will be. When Abner made this decision, he could have never imagined that very quickly... He was going to be in the position he's about to be in. That there would be such great division and such great harm coming his way. So it was that as many as came to the place where Ashahel fell down and died, stood still. When they saw Ashahel on the ground, they knew something significant had happened. They thought, oh, this is taking this whole thing up another notch. These are David's nephews. They're related to him. These are the children of his sister. And he just died. Uh Uh-oh. David's not going to stand for this. This thing's about to get more serious. Now motivated more than for the cause of David, they're going to want to avenge the death of their brother. Look what it says in verse 24. So Joab and Abishai also pursued Abner. Those Those are Azahel's brothers. And the sun was going down when they came to the hill of Amma, which is before Gia, by the road of the wilderness of Gibeon. Now the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner and built a unit and took their stand on top of the hill. So here's what happens. They're coming after them, and they're running for their lives. So they go up into a high spot, which is what you do militarily. You always want the high ground. They go up on the high ground. They surround Abner, and they're standing behind him, and they're fighting as the children of Israel, I mean the children of Judah, David's people, are coming up against them, and they're having this battle that's taking place. And guess what? More and more family is dying. Amen? Is David going to end up ruling over all these people? What's the answer? He is. But in the meantime, this is civil war. They're fighting amongst themselves because they're not listening to the Lord and they're being led by the flesh. So they take their stand on top of the hill. They position uh, of, of military strength. Now watch what happens. It says in verse 26, then Abner called to Joab, Shall the sword, the sword devour forever? 
Do you not know that it will be bitter in the latter end? How long will it be then until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brethren? All of a sudden, they're brothers now. Now he says, hey guys, how long are we going to let this go on? Who started this? Who brought this mess on? It's kind of like the guy that goes up and hits someone in the mouth, and then he starts getting the daylight speed out of him, and he starts going, hey bro, what, what's, what's the deal, man? Can't we just stop this right now? And that's what Abner did. Now what's amazing to me, though, is the word of God is still true, because a soft answer is going to turn away wrath. He basically is going to say to them, hey guys, we're brethren. Why are we fighting? He started it, but we're going to see a calmness brought to this situation. Sometimes we find ourselves fighting with the wrong people, and we end up hurting each other. It says in Galatians, for all law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed, you're not consumed, they're not consumed, you do not consume one another. Husbands and wives too often get into difficulty and find ourselves fighting each other. We shouldn't fight against each other. We're on the same side. Can I get an Amen. The Bible says we battle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities and evil forces of darkness in high places. The enemy is not other Christians. The enemy is the devil. Amen? And we're on the same side. Now, some wonder, did Joab know that his brother was dead yet? Had he heard about it? Some don't think he had because of what he does here. Look what happens. Joab said... As God lives, hey, I'm glad somebody, the Lord's mentioned. Bunch of dead people everywhere, and somebody finally brings up the Lord. Here's what it says. As God lives, unless you had spoken, surely by morning all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. All night long we would have fought. If you hadn't said anything, this war would have gone on until most of us were dead. But now you're making, giving an offer of a truce. Now again, I, I read... Uh, some of the usual potatoes, you know, commentators, amen? And, you know, you look at them, and they, they had different positions. Some said, oh, maybe they didn't know, or maybe he just decided to pull back, but he's going to plot to get him later. But in either case, these calm words between them is going to make this die down, at least for the moment, okay? But moved by selfishness and fear, what did he do? He was running away, and now he's in this position. And again, there's going to be this long-term battle that takes place. And so too it happens with us when we forget to pray. We open ourselves to a long-term battle with our own flesh. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and did not pursue Israel anymore, nor did they fight anymore. When you read that, they didn't pursue Israel anymore. Who's the, who's the rightful king of Israel? David, and they're David's guys, and they're fighting the people that David is really the king over, but they haven't recognized him as king. It's a mess, and this is what happens when we don't spend time on our knees seeking the Lord's wisdom and his direction. So look, there's a, there's a full-blown battle because he couldn't just yell out, hey, stop. He's blowing a trumpet, and when he blows the trumpet, he blows it in such a way that lets people know to cease fighting. So they're going to pull back, at least for the moment. But guess what? It's not going to last for long. So he blows the trumpet. Trumpets are used to control and communicate with the troops. His, the, this battle was over. And again, it was a, obviously a large cell battle. So now watch what happens as we finish up. Then Abner and his men went on all night through the plain, crossed over the Jordan, went through all Bithon, and then they came to Mahanaim. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants, how many? 19 plus Abishai, that's 20. But from the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin and Abner's men, how many? 360. 20 died on David's side, 360 on the guy who didn't pray, who didn't seek the Lord, who put up his own king who came down in his own fleshly might and dared to challenge the king that had been appointed by God and came against him. And in the end, 360 of his men died and 20 of David's men died. Now, some have said, oh, David's men learned how to fight when they were hanging out in the cave. I don't think that's the case. God's on their side. Amen? The Bible says when God's on your side, one will chase a thousand. Amen? So here they're having this victory and you would think Abner would learn. Hey, you know, uh, we had a bigger army, and we just got whipped 
because we were fighting in our own strength and God was on their side. Just remember that when the world seems to be coming against you, when you feel overwhelmed by your circumstances, when you don't understand what's going on, you need to know that you bless God as a majority. Amen? And if God is for us, who can be against us? And you don't have to worry about the system. You don't have to worry about you know, what it seems like is unfair. Guys, sometimes we're going to suffer that God may be glorified. And if that's what the Lord chooses to do with us, let's praise Him in the midst of it. Amen? As Job said, so I praise Him in times of blessing and not in times of adversity. So if we go through difficulty, God will use it for His glory. If we surrender our life to the Lord, He can do whatever He wants with it. But what you need to know is Satan can't touch you unless God allows it. And the enemy can't go after you unless the Lord allows it. And the world can't get to you unless the Lord allows it. Amen? And as Christians, we need to quit being so timid and so shy and allowing the world to shout us down. Now again, don't yell and scream. Don't be obnoxious. Be, be kind, be loving, be gracious, but be bold for the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's stand up for the Lord. Be unashamed of the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Abner's now afraid. By the way, this is the same dude who came marching down with his army. He ran away, and now he's still running. He's picking up ground, isn't he? He's going through town after town, getting as far away from David's men. Uh, come back next week. Let's see how it goes. Let's see what happens with Abner. Look what happens. Let's finish up. But the servants of David had struck down a Benjamin 365 who died. They took up Ashahel and buried him in his father's tomb, which is in where? Bethlehem is the city of David. Amen. This is because he's related to David. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at daybreak. So they went to the place where the Lord had sent them. They went back to the place the Lord had sent them. Let me just read verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Our strength comes from the Lord. Amen? It doesn't come from us trying harder or doing better, pulling up our bootstraps or uh, you know, learning better methods. You know where our strength comes from? Dying to self, being humble, broken, and desperate so that we can be usable for the kingdom of God and for His glory. Amen? Guys, the enemy may look overwhelming sometimes. Just remember that God's on your side. Amen? The enemy might, it might be cancer. The enemy might be finances. The enemy might be a son addicted to drugs. The enemy might be uh, a, a situation at work. The enemy might be whatever, it could, whatever that struggle is. Do you know our God is greater? And do you know that our God knew before the foundation of the world you were going to be going through this? And do you know that he walks with you through it? You're never alone. The enemy will lie to you and tell you you're alone. The enemy will tell you to isolate yourself when you're going through this stuff. The last thing you want to do is run from God. You need to run to him because he's got open arms waiting for you. Can I get an amen to that? So in closing, when a family forgets to pray, we declare war instead of seeking restoration. Guys, when we don't get on our knees and seek the Lord and cry out to Him, we're going to be in a battle fighting against the very people we should be loving on. Secondly, we're moved by selfishness and fear, and in fear we bring harm to others. Guys, we should not be bringing harm. We want to see people saved. Amen? And then finally, we open ourselves up to a long-term battle with the flesh. Guys, putting the flesh to death doesn't happen again in our strength. It happens in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank You. We praise You. We love You. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. And Lord, we thank you that no matter what battle we may face, no matter what trial or difficulty we may be going through tonight, that you're greater. You're an awesome God. You're all-knowing, almighty, all-powerful. Lord, we're thankful that we're your children, adopted into your family. Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Help us to keep our eyes off the waves and keep our eyes on the Savior. Lord, may we never step out without getting on our knees first without seeking your face, without being led by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.